take you home. We started on the Lankavatar Sutra. And Lankavatar is a wonderful sutra because it describes non-duality uh, from a fresh viewpoint. And it is one of, if not the most important sutras of the Zen school, Chan Buddhism. So, uh, you know, the Sanskrit word dhyan, which means meditation, becomes chan in, in Chinese and Zen in Japanese. So they're all about the same thing. And that is a meditation on the nature of reality. Lankavatar Sutra is really about the worldview of Zen. And so uh, the worldview of Zen is very similar to the worldview of Advaita as taught by Ramana and Shankaracharya and others, other great teachers. So I have to put on my glasses to read this. Uh, ah. Okay. So what is the world according to Zen? Well, first of all, it's non-dual. Non-dual means not two, advaita. So we call it non-dual instead of oneness because if you have oneness, then you could have oneness plus oneness equals two-ness. As, as soon as you start keeping score, that creates the possibility of multiplicity, duality, and more. So we call it non-dual, non-duality, advaita. And then the world is actually silent. Why is that? Because Sound is a vibration. It's an, it's an alternation between compression and rarefaction of a, of a medium. So because there's no vibration, actually, the actual world is silent. Because it's silent, it's nameless. There's no name, no names of anything. So even though in conventional thinking and ordinary consciousness, we give names to many different forms, uh, those are all imaginary. In and of themselves, they have no names. Even God has no name or quality. And uh, the reason for that is that the world is actually inexplicable. It cannot be explained by words. And this is called ineffable or ineffability. It's inexplicable uh, because, well, I'm run down a whole list of things here. It's dimensionless. There's no way to measure it. It's immeasurable. And it's also boundaryless. And, and because of that, there's no way to separate one thing from another thing. Any boundaries that we set are simply imaginary. And again, because it's silent, there's no vibration, means there's no time. Because we measure time by the, the swing back and forth between the extremes of vibrations. So 
Because of this, the world is changeless. If it's timeless, there's no time to have a change. Change requires time. It also requires dimensions and measurement. See, but actually the world is immeasurable, dimensionless, boundaryless. There's no difference between this and that. And therefore it's changeless. So this leads to the Advaitins, both the Advaitins and the Zen people call the world unborn, ajata. Because it's unborn, it's also undying. Now, what does that mean? It means that the world is not a thing in itself. Rather, it is an epiphenomenon of consciousness. An epiphenomenon is something that's not real. Like we were talking about earlier, uh, a mirage or an illusion, a dream. So therefore, it's uh, non-verbal, non-conceptual, beyond reason, and very importantly, it's impersonal. Oops. There's no persons there because the I, the ego, the individual identity, is another one of these dreamlike epiphenomena that we create in the mind. And the Buddha has explained all this in the Mula Pariyaya Sutta. How the mind creates the idea of I without there being such a thing. And basically what it does is it projects the concept of mind on the objects of the world. The objects are imaginary. The idea of mind is imaginary, but you know, mind doesn't care about that. <laughs> mind just says, oh look, this thing and that thing and all these other things are mine. So I must exist. See, if all this is mine, then I must reveal. I must be a person and I possess all these things. But this is all illusion. This is all concoction. This is all imagination. So because of this, the world is impersonal. It's like a dream. In a dream, there are apparently different people but the whole thing is happening in your mind. So they're actually all reflections of you. The same thing is true of the world in general. It's like a dream. So it's impersonal, non-individual, and it's also non-general. Just because we happen to see a pattern nearby in our environment, then we start to speculate that this is something universal. And the scientists are very uh, happy to discover all these laws, as they call them, and then assume that they apply everywhere and all the time. But actually, of course, there's no evidence for that. We can't go you know, halfway across the galaxy and measure whether something is working the same as it does here. In any case, searching for these patterns is futile because the pattern itself is something projected on the reality. And for every time that we uh, successfully can do that, there are many times that we can. And we all have experience of this trying to uh, project a pattern on the world and predict its behavior and failing to predict. But in those cases, what happens is the mind simply jumps to the next thought. 
if we observe ourselves carefully, we'll see how this goes on. So the mind never admits to being wrong, say, <laughs> unless you observe it very carefully, you catch it in the act. So the world exists only in the mind, the patterns, the boundaries, the changes, the movements, the qualities, the objects, and so on. And so because of this, the world is actually effortless. It's effortless without any striving, without any doing, without any work, because there's no doer, there's no ego, there's no uh, self with a small s, empirical self. So all of these things mean um, that the world actually arises from and exists within the mind. See, in ordinary thought, we have this completely backwards. We think, well, there's a world, and in this world, there's this body, and in this body, there's this mind, and in this mind, there's consciousness, and in this consciousness, there's a self. But no, it's actually completely the other way around. There's the self. Brahma, the universal self, which has a universal mind. Then that mind is reflected in so many different bodies. Like the moon is reflected in puddles after a rain. And because of this, then the objects that apparently exist in the world arise in the consciousness due to the the differentiations, the boundaries that we create, that we speculate into existence, that we imagine. And so it's said that the world is illusory, maya, that which does not really exist. So the world is actually unborn or uncreated. It's egoless without a soul, uh, because a soul is an imaginary thing, uh, an identity, individual identity that's permanent. And there ain't no such animal. So identity, just like everything else in the world is always apparently changing, impermanent. So that means it's not really the self. That the self is without change, without activity, without even consciousness, because consciousness means awareness of an object, and there are no objects. <laughs> so the world is only perpetuated by habit. We pick up these mental habits early in life. And we use them to perpetuate the apparency of the world. And because of this, the world seems to exist. And like I said, uh, we seem to exist within the world and so on. But actually, none of it is true. It's all like a dream. Like the famous example of the rope and the snake. Person goes out at night in the dim light, in the darkness. They see a rope, but they don't recognize it as a rope. They think it's a snake. Why is that? Because they have some memory or they have heard that snakes are dangerous and they hang around at night and stuff like that. So the world is the same way. The world arises because of our thinking, because of our imagination, and it persists because of our habits which are things that we learned in the past, conditioning. And until we perform the sadhana to erase that conditioning, like I was talking about in the video today, to reformat 
your mind. Like erase the whole disk, right? <laughs> Start all over again. Uh, then we cannot see the reality because the reality is hidden by all these imaginary things. So this is the process of self-realization. And it's done by meditation, dhyan, or chan, or zen, or in Pali, jhan. It's just all the same word, and it has the same meaning. So, you know, this is why I say, actually, the religions of the world, the different spiritual paths, are all ultimately one. None of them are invalid as far as they go. It's just that they normally, in most cases, don't go very far. <laughs> and the Buddha's teaching and teachings like Ramana's and Shankaracharya's are wonderful because they do go all the way, all the way to this uh, nonverbal, intuitive, inexplicable, indescribable enlightenment in which words are left far behind. And one comes to an intuitive awareness of the, the real nature of reality, which, as I said, is backwards from the conventional view.